<laughs> I might have to be from now on anyway after, <laughs> after last week. Yeah. <laughs> you said I was going to tell a story. I have no idea where that story was going or what walked the line had to do with that or... Yeah, sure we did. All right, we're going to be in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5, if y'all would like to turn there. <laughs> 2 Samuel, not 1 Samuel where we've been, but we're going to be in 2 Samuel, jumping ahead to chapter 5 and 6 tonight. Uh, so we're going to cover a little bit of ground uh, in a message simply titled King David, uh, because, you know, we've been following David who had been anointed as king, but he was not king because Saul was alive. And so David was a fugitive. He was on the run. He was... Um, trying to stay alive so that one day he could become king. And remember, as I said last week, this is a series on David, not 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel. So we're, we're, we're skipping chunks of it, just looking at some of the key parts of David's life here. So we're skipping the part where Saul and his son Jonathan were killed in battle. We're skipping uh, even the civil war that broke out because David was supposed to be the next king. But as you turn the page after the death of Saul into 2 Samuel, um, the, the captain of the army or the commander of the army uh, Abner, his son Ishbosheth becomes, he kind of makes himself the king uh, in David's place. He's thinking, well, the king's dead, the prince is dead, but my father would have been kind of like next in line as the commander of the army. So as his son, he's thinking, I'm the next king, and he doesn't recognize David, so he makes himself king, and there's a civil war in Israel. And so David waited all those years to become king, and yet now he finally doesn't become king because uh, it's, it's, there's a, a broken country. And so David has to wait uh, even much later for him to finally get to become king. So we're going to pick up in chapter 5. We're going to see that David has finally become king of Israel. And uh, David wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Israel. The, the Ark of the Covenant has not been there. Saul didn't care anything about it, for, for one thing. But, but after uh, Saul and Jonathan and, and the Israelite army, after they were defeated, the Ark of the Covenant was taken. The, the people, the, the Philistines, they didn't really know what it was, but they could tell this must be important. This must have some value to it. And so they, they take the Ark of the Covenant. So eventually after David becomes king, his first order of business is he wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant home. In order to do that, he's going to have to defeat the people that took the Ark from him. So the first thing we see tonight, number one, we're going to see that David defeats the army. If you're in chapter 5, we're going to skip all the way down to verse uh, 17. And we'll pick up there as we see David defeats the army. In verse 17 of 2 Samuel 5, it says, When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it, and he went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up. For I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And David came to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. Therefore, the name of that place is called Baal Perazim, which, uh, what that means in, in the, it's the Hebrew expression, it's to give us a picture of like a rushing stream of water breaking through a dam and flowing uh, kind of out of control. And that, he's saying, that's the way that God was going to give them victory, like just barreling through the army. So in verse 21, it says, The Philistines left their idols there, and David and his men carried them away. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread out in the, villi, uh, uh, in the valley of Rephaim. So we see here that David is quickly tested right away. Nothing like your, your first couple of days on the job. Nothing like kicking off your days as king. Nothing like a war to get it started. But that's what David has to do. He's not dealt an easy hand as king. He has to retaliate and respond right away to the Philistines. When they hear that there's a new king, they're thinking, well, we need to nip this in the bud before he becomes a powerful king. So the Philistine army is getting ready. David gets his armies ready. But notice again, like we saw last week, what does he do? He prays. He inquires of the Lord. Last week, remember, we talked about those stones that they would put into the ephod where the priest would pull them out. You know, the, the light or the dark was like the yes or the no. And that's what David did. But here it just says he inquires of the Lord. We don't know if he consults the ephod again. We don't know if he prays and he hears an audible voice. We don't know how it's done. But David doesn't just say, I'm king now. I got this. I know what I'm doing. But David inquires of the Lord. And he says, shall I do this? Shall I go to war? 
And, and uh, the Lord responds to him. He says, go, yes, I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. It cannot be overstated the importance of seeking the Lord's will before we make a decision. Even some mundane decisions, we should always be guided by God. We should pause and say, Lord, is this what you want me to do? Sometimes it might be a common sense thing. Well, of course God does, but sometimes God might say, hang on, hang on. No, I don't. And so it's important that we be sensitive to that, to always consult the Lord. So notice how God comes through at the end of this chapter. We left off in verse 22, and uh, we'll pick up in verse uh, 23, and we will uh, finish this chapter here. It says, And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, the Lord said, You shall not go up, but go around their rear. Now God is giving David battle plans here. Don't go up, but you go around from the rear, and come against them opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the, tr- in the tops of the balsam trees, then rouse yourself, for then the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistine. And David did as the Lord commanded him, and struck down the Philistines from Geba to Gezer. So David is not even getting his battle plans here from the generals. David, who had slain his ten thousands, right, was no stranger to war. David's not the one coming up with the battle plan here. The Lord says, yeah, David, I want you to go, but not the way that you're planning. I've got a much better tactical operation for you. I want you to flank them from behind. I want you to go to the rear of the army. And when you hear this sound in the trees, that's your cue. When you hear that, you rush into battle. Why? Because the Lord, he's saying, I am the one striking down the enemy. God is literally fighting the battle here for David and his men. Now, they had a part to play. They, they went out and they kind of finished the job. But God got it started. He guaranteed victory. And the Lord is the one that allows David to conquer the enemy, for the Israelites to defeat the Philistines and make it possible for David to have a peaceful kingdom, but also for the Ark of the Covenant to be able to return home. So David defeats the army. But number two, we're going to see that David delivered the Ark. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to find the Ark of the Covenant, and he wanted to bring it home. But there's a problem, that David does not do it the way that he's supposed to do it. And there's a consequence for that. So David actually has a failed attempt to bring home the Ark. As we see number two, David delivers the Ark. In Moving into chapter six, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but we'll read, um, picking up in verse five, when they get to the Ark of the Covenant. Verse five of chapter six says, And David and all the house of Israel... We're celebrating before the Lord their victory, celebrating with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Yuza put forth his hand to the ark of God, and he took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Yuza, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah, or some say lashed forth. And that place is called Perez, Uzzah, to this day, which in Hebrew means God lashed out at Uzzah. And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. So David has this great desire, this burning in his heart. Lord, I want to do something good for you. I want to go get the ark of the covenant. I want to bring it back where it belongs to the tabernacle. This is a good thing. This is nothing selfish in David. It's not prideful. This is where it belongs. Remember, what was the Ark of the Covenant? If you're not familiar, it was not just furniture. It was not just a box to store stuff in. It had the Ten Commandments in it. It had the showbread placed on it. A lot of ceremonial, symbolic things. But the mercy seat was there, where the two angels that faced each other, where the incense was burned. On the Day of Atonement, when the the Passover lamb was offered on behalf of the people, the blood was sprinkled onto the mercy seat, and most importantly is God's presence, that Shekinah, the glory of God, lived 
in that box. It was the only way that God could be among his people. From the days of Adam and Eve's sin, God said, well, I can't come down and walk in the cool of the day with you anymore, you sinners. I'm holy and you're not. And the only way God could be close to his people is he says, put this ark, this box, in the middle of the tabernacle and I will send my, my spirit, my presence, to dwell in that ark. Inside the holy of holies. That's when, why today when Paul says, don't you know that your body is, we say the temple, in, in, in Greek Paul says your body is the holy of holies. Paul was saying your body is the ark of the covenant. God's spirit now dwells in you. That's the, what the Holy Spirit of God is. His Shekinah come to be with us. And it was gone. And David said, I want to bring the ark home. I want to bring it back so God can live among us again. So we can be close to God by being near this ark. This was a good thing that David wanted, but he didn't do it the right way. In Numbers chapter 4, Moses was given very specific instructions for how to handle the ark. Only the Levites were supposed to be the ones to transport the ark. Remember, the Levites were the priestly people. And so it wasn't just for anybody to do it. And in in Numbers chapter 4, verse 15, the Bible says, And do not touch that holy thing, for in the day you touch it, Similar to what Adam and Eve were told, when you touch it, you will surely die. This was the most holy thing in the world. The closest representation of God under heaven was this ark. You were not to touch it. Now, there was ways to transport it. Imagine like a stretcher today. You put somebody in a stretcher. You could shimmy that stretcher under, but only Levites can do it. And they would carry the four corners of the poles that supported the ark of the covenant. And and so they did that, and they got it onto the back. Uh, of an oxen or onto a cart, most likely, that the oxen was dragging. And so as they're doing a good thing, taking the ark home, the oxen stumbles. We don't know exactly how that happened, but evidently the ark begins to move. Is it going to slide off the cart? Is it going to topple over? Is it top-heavy? We don't really know, but this well-meaning individual reaches out and maybe even a reflex, and he puts his hands on it to steady it. He doesn't want it to fall. He doesn't want it to break. What are they going to do if it topples over? And he reaches out there and puts his hands on it. And he falls over dead. Well, it wasn't the way that God said to do it. It wasn't the right people moving it. It wasn't supposed to be touched. And however well-intentioned, it wasn't God's way. And so David becomes angry. David becomes afraid of the Lord. And so David even lashes out, we're going to name this spot the place where God lost his temper and killed one of my people. That's basically what David is saying. We're going to name it that. Because God was a little too vengeful, a little too wrathful. God maybe overreacted in this situation. But David didn't do it right, however well-intentioned. I remember the first time I heard this story. I remember I I went to a Christian school, so we had had Bible class at school. I can picture my third grade teacher telling us this story. And she was, and she, you know, had this graphic picture. She was uh, portraying the man pushing the ark back onto the ox cart. And she said he fell over dead. And as a third grader, I remember thinking, Seems harsh, right? I mean, they're trying to do something good. And I remember as a third grader thinking that God sounded kind of scary or I I didn't want to mess up and maybe God will strike me dead. I remember having those thoughts as a third grader. And I, I understand, David, I'm sympathetic to David being a little angry with the Lord. God, why would you do this? We're trying to do a good thing here. But I think what David probably understood deep down and what I've come to understand now that I'm no longer in third grade is that God is holy and he's specific, and when God says, here's how to do it, that is how you do it. If God says, do it this way, you do it this way. If God says, don't do it that way, you don't do it that way. And and this is the holiest thing that they had, and God says, you're not going to do this lightly. You're not just going to go willy-nilly and pick up the Ark of the Covenant. Remember where it was located, in the Holy of Holies. You couldn't even approach that. You couldn't go beyond the curtain unless you were the high priest. Not just a priest, but the high priest. There was only one of them. And only one day a year could the high priest even enter that holy of holies, or that most holy place. This was a special, unique thing. God says, you don't touch this thing, or else you die. And so when this guy touches it, however well-intentioned, God did exactly what God said he was going to do. And now that might make us nervous, that might make us tremble, but it should make us stop and realize that God is holy, and he's specific, and he's sovereign, and God gets to set the rules and say, this is how it's going to be. Now you and I, don't, we don't have to worry, there's no Ark of the Covenant for us to touch today, 
But God still gives us rules. He still has a way go, to go about doing things. And David learned his lesson from this. He says, all right, we're not even going to touch this thing. We're going to leave it here, and we're going to let Obed-Edom keep an eye on it. At least it is now inside our territory. It's crossed the boundaries, and we're just going to leave it alone. And for three months, David goes back home, and for three months, it says the Lord blesses Obed-Edom. We don't know how financially, livestock, children. We, we don't know how this looks. But word comes back to David, hey, Obed-Edom, the guy's cleaning up over there. Ever since you dropped off the ark, things have been great for him. And so David says, okay, let's give this another shot. Let's bring it back the way that we are supposed to do it. So David gives it the second try, but this time he does it God's way. I want to read to you 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 2. When you get Samuel and Chronicles, you have a lot of the same stories uh, told from sometimes different vantage points. So in 1 Chronicles 15, 2, it says, Then David said, that no one but the Levites may carry the ark of God. For the Lord had chosen them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister to him forever. This time David says, we're going to go get the ark, but we'll do it God's way this time. And so the new king quickly learned his lesson. He wasn't going to do it his way and in his strength, thinking he knows best, but he was going to obey God. So they bring the ark of the covenant home, and David is elated. He's ecstatic. He is so glad that the ark is there. They've defeated their enemies. He's the new king. His approval rating's got to be through the roof at this point. They've already danced about him in the streets. Yes, yeah, Saul slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. Now he becomes king. He beats the Philistines, brings the ark home. Everybody is loving it. And so that takes us to number three. We'll close here that David danced for the Almighty. David went a little Pentecostal on his people. David was so full of emotion, he was thrilled, and he could not keep it in. David, there's no way he was a Baptist. His wife was most likely a Baptist. We're going to see from her here in just a second. But if we're in chapter 6, let's, let's read verses uh, 20 down to, um, to the end of the chapter. It says, And David returned to bless his household. But Michal, remember her, uh, the daughter of Saul? This was David's prize for killing Goliath, was to marry the king's daughter. So she came out to meet David, and she said, Oh, how the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself before the eyes of his servants, his female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michal, It was before the Lord, who chose me above your father and above all his house, to appoint me as a prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. It was before him, he's saying, and I will celebrate before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. But by the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. I said, David's David's first wife, Michal, she must have been a Baptist. As she looks out the window and she sees her husband dancing before God, she said, and, and this is incredibly sarcastic if you didn't pick up on it, and she says in the King James, oh, how glorious the king of Israel looked today. And she doesn't mean that. She's saying, here's basically what she's saying, David, I was embarrassed by your actions today. I was humiliated to be known that I am the wife of you. You embarrassed me, David. You were only thinking about yourself. You were acting like a child. You looked foolish out there today, David. Oh, how glorious the king of Israel looked. She says, you acted like one of those vulgar fellows. You were undressed. And there were ladies out there, David. And you were going around so scandalously undressed. Now, of course, David removed that outer kingly garment that he had on. It's not like David was uncovering himself. It's not like David was immodest. He had simply removed his kingly garment. And he was saying, I'm not king right now. I'm just a happy person. I'm just a child of God. And David's out here dancing with you know, tambourines and everything. This is like a coming home parade from war. And David, and by the way, I'm joking about the Baptists, saying, y'all lighten up, you Baptists. You're proving my point. Y'all just look stone-faced. How dare you? But David is out here dancing. And, and we don't know what this looks like. We don't know if David had a rhythm or not. We don't know if David's just cutting loose 
We don't know what this looks like, but you know the point is? David doesn't care what it looks like. He doesn't care what anybody thinks. He doesn't care what his wife thinks. He doesn't care what those young ladies think. He doesn't care about anything else. He's saying, look, I am worshiping God. And don't you judge me for it. I'm just worshiping my God. And he says, those ladies that you're so concerned with, I am held in honor in their sight. You might be embarrassed of me, but they are glad to have me as their king right now. Well, he's not bragging. He's just saying, look, I'm worshiping God. We're a Christian people after all, you know, Old Testament equivalent. He's saying, look, I'm just worshiping God. Remember our last king, your father? He didn't do this. He didn't care about God. And all the years that we had King Saul, nobody cared. There's no dancing, no celebrating, no worshiping, no praising. And now here we are having revival breaking out, and you're upset that I took off my coat. You're upset that I'm out here dancing. And he's, basically when he says, I will be yet the more contemptible, he's in essence saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm just getting started here. Give me a tambourine because I'm going to keep worshiping my God. I love the fact that David could not care less what anybody else thinks about him. He's saying, this is between me and my God. And I think we forget that when we come in church sometimes. And I, I, I poke fun at the Baptist. Don't forget I am one. I've been a Baptist since my earliest days. But I think sometimes we come into church and we think, uh, you know, I, I'd like to clap my hands along with this song, but what are they going to think of me if I clap my hands? You know, they, they may escort me out. I'd like to, heaven forbid, lift up my hand and worship, but what are they going to think behind me? They're going to, you know, like, what's, what's his problem? What's, what's God into her? And so we, we keep these things to ourselves. Well, I'll just stand here and I'll stand at attention. And, but boy, if God is wanting you to cut loose, you cut loose. I, I, I mean, look, we don't need to start drawing attention to ourselves for, I'm being serious, for attention's sake. Because some people do that. Some people do it for attention's sake. Some people think this. Because if you go into a charismatic church or a Pentecostal church, they go, many of them can go the extreme opposite side. And they think, well, in order for me to look holy, in order for me to look like everybody else, if I want to really look saved, then I've got to, you know, do backflips and get the Holy Spirit and fake a seizure, and I've got to run laps around the building, and, and whatever else they do, in order for me to look holy, I've got to do the opposite. And so we can be guilty of being on both extremes. By the way, the, the good thing about being a, a Pentecostal or charismatic is you get all your Fitbit steps in 20 minutes into church. <laughs> Preacher ain't even got started yet, and you've met your goals. It's, it's ideal. I saw it in the Babylon Bee, by the way. But, uh, but, but people can be guilty of being on one of two extremes. You, you can be so stone-faced and thinking, I, I don't want them to judge me, that you don't worship God. You, you don't do what you might feel led to do. Have you ever read the Psalms? You, you can't get away from all the times it says to clap your hands and rejoice. You can't get away from the, all the times the Bible says to lift up holy hands. To, to worship God, and, and that was the posture of prayer, by the way. We, we bow our head and close our eyes, fold our hands. They pray with hands open and outstretched as if to say, God, here's my empty hands. Would you fill them up? God, would you give me what I can't do? And this, this is how they worship God. They would pray like this, Lord, I'm ready to receive from you today. But we can be so guilty of, well, I don't want them to think I'm Pentecostal, and, and I don't want them to judge me. So we don't do what God may be laying on our hearts to do. And, and by the way, that's not for everybody. It's not, I'm not saying you're not right with God if you don't start clapping your hands and rejoicing. Some people don't do it. Some people don't have rhythm. Some people don't like to do it. Some people prefer the stillness. Some people prefer the reverence. But the point is you just be you. You just do what God has laid on your heart. And don't go to the opposite side and say, I'm going to draw attention to myself so they're all going to think, boy, that's a super Christian over there. Look at them clapping their hands and carrying on. Uh, boy, I'm not as holy as that person. So don't draw attention to yourself for attention's sake. In other words, don't care about anybody else. Don't worry if they're judging you for being too conservative. They're judging you for being too liberal. Don't worry about anybody else. You only care about God. And if he lays it on your heart to start clapping your hands, by all means, clap your hands. If he lays it on your heart to raise your hands, and by all means, raise your hands. And if you want to shout out, hallelujah, amen, you shout out hallelujah and amen, and you do what God has laid on your heart. David just cut loose the king of Israel, the most identifiable man in the world, and he didn't care what anybody thought of him. He's happy, and the emotion overflows, and he begins to dance in the street. And he tells her, I'm just getting started here. You have not seen anything yet. 
but yet she looks down her nose at David. Let us not be guilty of that person that throws cold water on somebody who's excited. Boy, David just can't contain himself for all that God has done. And he gets home and he's probably thinking, boy, when I get home, my wife, she's going to be so pumped up. We're going to praise God together. I just can't wait to get home. And he walks in and she's just waiting for him there. Oh, look who's home, Mr. Dancer. You know, oh, you shameful. And he just can't wait to get home. And there she is just pouring cold water on David. Let us not be that person. Let us not find somebody who's worshiping God and us be that person like we talked about this morning, that negative person that comes in and quenches that fire in their life. We should let that person be contagious and say, oh, I hope I catch on fire too. But instead we douse that person. We put them out. Let us not be guilty of doing what she did. So we see that David didn't really care what anybody else thought. He didn't care about his appearance. He didn't care how he came across. His motive was pure. I just want to worship God. I just want to praise God. And we all may do that very differently. You know, we're all wired very differently. Some of us are more outgoing than others. Some are more reserved than others. And there's no right and there's no wrong. It's part of what makes us unique. It's part of what keeps us all from being the same and being boring if we were all identical to one another. So it's just however God has wired you. But you feel free to be who God has made you to be. And I promise this is a judgment-free zone when it comes to worshiping God. So you have the freedom to do what God has laid on your heart to do. Let us not be guilty of being on either extremes. Let us not be guilty of being like David's wife who quickly extinguished the flame, that fire that David had. So we're going to, in the the message here, um, you don't have to stand up. In fact, because uh, we're going to go into a conference, I want to do the stand-up, sit-down thing. So you guys can remain seated. Uh, but I just want to have a word of prayer. Can we just do that? And I don't know as far as the invitation, we'll just... Oh, sorry, Bobby. You, you're good back there. Yeah, I'm sure you're good. All right. Um, I, I just want to pray, and, and you guys can pray right where you sit. Uh, and, and maybe the Lord's laid anything in your heart. Just use this time. You pray while I do. And uh, once I say amen, we'll, then we'll start going to the conference. We won't have like a quiet time. We'll just, we'll pray, all right? Lord, I thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight. I thank you that, that we can look at David, a man who um, was, was dignified, a man who was a good king, a man who was a warrior, but yet a man whose heart was tender and would not care what anybody thought. He would cut loose and worship you, motivated by the good things that you had done in his life. And Lord, if you lay something like that on our hearts, I pray that we would not be worried about what anybody else thinks and maybe miss an opportunity to praise you, maybe miss an opportunity to inspire somebody else because we're so worried about, well, what are they going to think of me? Lord, I pray that we would always feel that freedom to worship you in spirit and truth, to honestly worship you the way that we feel like you would have us to do it, whatever that looks like, without judgment. Lord, I pray that we would never do it to draw attention to ourselves. I I pray that we would never lift up our hands and carry on so that people think that we're something special. I pray that our worship would always be about worshiping you, about pointing people to you, not drawing attention to ourselves. And Lord, let us never be like Michal. Let us never be like that lady that saw somebody so excited and because her pride was wounded, because she was embarrassed, she poured cold water on her husband. Let us never be like that. Lord, let us rejoice with those who rejoice and never in our jealousy or in our our wounded pride, let us never try to bring other people down. As misery loves company, Lord, I pray that we wouldn't be like that. If there's a miserable person here, Lord, I pray that they would let the joy of the Lord become their strength. So, Lord, I pray that you would be with us in a few minutes here as we're going to begin our conference. I pray that you would guide us during this time. I thank you for all that you do for us. And, Lord, I, I pray if there's anyone here tonight that maybe doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray so that even right where they sit, that they would say a silent prayer invite you into their life, forgive you their heart. Lord, I thank you for all that you do for us. And I says prayer in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you if I...